Welcome, gentlemen. Glad to have you guys. Thanks for making it out. I know it was a long travel for you, Marty. Yeah, I live literally four minutes away. Perfect. Well, I know that you uh, still made the hike, so I appreciate it. Uh, I just kind of wanted to talk to you guys about the experience that Max having right now with getting in with uh, uh, Coffee or Die and then uh, just what it's like to start working for that company and, and Marty's involvement since, since you've gotten started. Uh, well, my first interaction with Marty was probably a few years ago. Uh, I read Violence of Action book, posted about it, and I, I, we had a very brief conversation then. And since then, we've kind of gone back and forth a few times about uh, different books. And then when I left my previous job, we were having a conversation. I told him that, and I'm trying to be a writer. And he said, well, hey, why don't you, you know, try writing an article, freelance for us. We'll see if it's any good. And uh, they liked it. Did a second one. They liked that and uh, have been very lucky. <laughs> what was that first article about? I think it was, it was one of the, the lists of like three books every, three books every uh, new lieutenant should read. What were those three books? Oh, let me see if I can remember. I wanted to do like three books that um, lieutenant, because I'm sure brand new lieutenants get handed a stack of books. Like you got to read these if you're going to be a leader. And a lot of those I think are not approachable books if you don't like to read. So you get handed you know, Clausewitz or The Art of War or something like that. And like there's a lot of good shit in there, but they're not necessarily page turners uh, or at least for me, I need someone to walk me through the lessons in those books. Uh, so Ender's Game, Gates of Fire, books that are actually good stories, but still teach those valuable lessons. And I think that it's a much better list for someone getting started off. And then what was like the appeal that wanted you guys write that story? Was it his involvement with Pipes and Pages or was strictly kind of just his writing style and like, how it's kind of progressed till now? Oh, yeah. I mean, it totally started off as just like I was a fanboy. It was like, oh, this, I, I like Pipes and Pages. It's a cool, unique concept, and I think in the the back of my head, it's just like, you know, clearly this guy has uh, an affinity for books, has a clear style, is creative in more ways than just words by virtue of what you see with what he does with his photography and the way he does pipes and uh, pages. Um, and so for me, it, it was just like, yeah, like 100%, let's, you know, let's go on an article. You, I've learned at this point, I think earlier on, in my tenure as an editor, I made the mistake of being too um, willing to like get people going based off of something else that I'd seen them doing. Or and, and so that's where I was like, hey, let's send an article and take one. I don't want to promise the world or anything like that. Even though I was a fan of uh, what he was doing, um, it just was like, you know, let's let's just try this out. Let's see what your raw copy looks like. And uh, yeah, and he, I mean, turning a good article is engaging. I think it did pretty well. If I remember correctly, I think it did pretty well for us. And it was just like, all right, guy knows how to write. And oh, he's a former Marine. He's a, you know, former law enforcement officer. Like there's, uh, you know, he knows how to compose a sentence. Like, all right, like this. Oh, oh, and by the way, he seems to have an eye for composition in a photograph, which we ask a lot of our people to kind of be these like multimedia journalists almost, right? It's kind of a cliche term right now, but we do. We, we send people out with, you know, expecting them to come back with written stories, photos, and videos to go with it, you know? And, and so it was like clearly Mac, even though he's not, um, uh, you know, hasn't been working in this space for that long, he has that potential there, you know? And for, especially for Coffee or Die, it's like, man, if there's anything we can do, it should be giving, you know, veterans who want to get into this space a chance. Like, give them a shot. What they do with that shot is up to them, right? Like, it was up to Mac to turn in a good article, to turn it in on time, and all that other stuff, right? It was up to him, but, like, the least we can do is give somebody that served their country, clearly has potential, give them the shot, see what they do with it. And Mac fucking, you know, he killed it. And, uh, you know, got him going on some more freelance articles and when the, a position that made sense for him became available. Yeah, I think that, that making sense is the, that first article being already a book recommendation of some mm. sense, a list, you know, like that was already kind of in your forte of uh, pipes and pages. And since you're already kind of fanboying in some sense, but is that typically like the relationship where they kind of get access to the executive editor relatively early or is there some vetting done? Because obviously... <laughs> Like, he created a name on his own by his own creative works. And so 
that is on him for putting himself out there yep. in the right way. And that's what it's usually about is the individual. And There's something to be the said about it. taking initiative, yeah. right? Yeah. He took the initiative on his own to create a platform, prove that there, you know, prove that there was an audience for that platform. There's something to be said about that. Th that being said, I do think that you're a little bit of a one-off as mm -hmm. far as, um, you know, I'm not going to say that every person who's got, you know, a couple followers on Instagram is going to write for us, right? Like that's not necessarily the case. I think just the stars happen to line up with Mac where it was, hey, he's got a, a platform that I really enjoy. He's got the right background for us. It's just everything kind of lined up a little bit. But there's people, I, I will say that there's a lot of a lot of the people that we have both uh, in our freelance pool as well as on staff at this point, a lot of them are people that I've either had some sort of interaction with in the past or came at the strong recommendation of, uh, of somebody else that I do know, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that when you're looking to get into, if you're trying to write professionally, um, you know, if you're a, a book author, maybe it's not as important. I think I still think it's important in the marketing of your book. But if you're trying to get into like professional writing, like get a staff writer job or anything like that, it's, I don't think I can say it enough how important just networking is. You know, and I don't mean networking like go to a fucking mixer and hand out your business card that says fucking writer. Like, that's dumb. Gotta get this um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I, I think networking is like, hey, go out there, start writing, start getting bylines, create your own platform. If you don't have, if you can't get anybody to publish you, start fucking writing anyway. Put your shit out there. And then you've at least got something to show a prospective editor or best case scenario editor comes across your stuff organically is a fan and you know like that's the way to do it but i think networking getting yourself out there so it's not and not expecting immediate results because there's a lot of the people that we work with it's like you know like you said yeah. shit we've been conversing you know just through DMs three years yeah yeah well so that's what's kind of cool about your page is like people may have started to know who your actual name is mm -hmm. but it's always tagged pipes and pages there's no pictures of you yeah like the only way I knew what you looked like is because you ended up sending a picture of us in a DRC shirt for like the longest time, you know, and <laughs> yeah. then like we made a couple phone calls. And so when I finally saw you in person, I was like, okay, all that clicks, okay, that's who he is, you know? Yeah. So you did a really good job kind of hiding who you were attached to something that you created, which I think there's some respect into that because you're not trying that, to tell That was story. important to me yeah. from the start. You know, I, how lucky I've gotten to land this new job is not lost on me. It's half luck and half hard work but a lot of that hard work didn't have you know this end state from the beginning it was just all right this is the obvious next step work hard at it that'll present the next step but for pipes and pages it was never about like all right how am i going to promote my own work so i can land a job let's start an instagram page with books and pipes it was i like to read i want to network uh, i want to connect with other people not for the hope of landing a cool job in the future but because you know, that's good for you as a person to connect with the people that challenge you. Um, so that was the point of Pipes and Pages. Not here's my work. I also like books. Here's pictures of me reading. It was all about the books because that brought in uh, the right people who know more about me, know more uh, than me about writing and reading. And uh, it was the perfect way to draw them in without, no one wants to see pictures of you pretending to read or like be oops, like who, I don't even have like a personal Instagram because it just doesn't seem like uh, it benefits anybody. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was important to keep it relatively anonymous. Like I don't hide my identity with it, but it, the focus always had to be on the books and on the content and not me creating it. And I think that there's a certain amount of genuineness that, not that people are wrong for posting pictures of themselves or creating a platform around there. And I think that they're, I don't think it doesn't help anybody. I think for some people it's like, hey, there's, um, I think there's a problem in journalism right now where people like to demonize journalism and it's like this faceless entity, right? Like journalists or mainstream media. And it's like this big, bad, yeah, and it's like, I think we need to do a better job of showing, hey, these are real people behind these bylines. And, and so I think that there is value to that. But also I think in Mac's case, there was what, what shined through for me was just that, hey, guy's literally passionate about books and loves literature, loves reading. Um, I assume likes, uh, you know, putting some tobacco in a pipe as well, you know, and 
you know, you, there's a certain amount of genuineness that comes like, so you don't necessarily need a picture of Mac to know who Mac is. You kind of know who Mac is by what he's posting. And I think that there's that, that genuineness and, and the fact that he wasn't pandering and trying to position himself for a book deal or a job or anything like that. It's just like, hey, I'm just, this is who I am. And that uh, attracts people, I think, you know? And um, I assume it probably led to some, you know, networking opportunities and stuff. It got me connected with you guys uh, kind of around when you were starting, when I started Pipes and Pages, just because we were like, hey, we're like-minded people and yeah. we had some good conversations. And there's something to be said about, like, if you're a new writer, I think that's kind of like what we're getting at here is like, hey, how do you get that first writing job? How do you, like, what's the process? What are some TTPs there? And um, I think one of it is, is like, you know, don't sit there and wait around for somebody to publish you. Start putting stuff out there. I mean, in my case, I started a website and started bringing on writers. And you, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't wait for the New York Times to call me back, you know, or the Atlantic or something. I think there's a lot of writers who put themselves on like, oh, I'm only going to submit stuff, you know, to the Atlantic or Esquire or the New York Times or something like, or Harper's. Like, it's like, yeah, man, if, if you get published over there, great, good for you. But for most people, they're going to be, if you're holding your breath for that, you're going to be holding your breath for a long time. And it's better to start going most of, and speaking as somebody who's sorting through resumes and, and trying to find that needle in the haystack that's a right fit for the team. Uh, it's kind of hard to hire somebody who has no track record. I get a lot of resumes and stuff in from people who it's like, I haven't, they have, they've never written anything and they list all their other jobs that they've done and clearly, the, and they say, you know, in a cover letter, something like, I want to be a writer and all this other stuff. Well, I don't want to hire people that want to be writers. I want to hire people that are writers. That doesn't mean you need to be, have bylines in the biggest publications or be on staff at a newspaper necessarily. That means you're currently writing, that you're putting stuff out there via, via your own blog or, or other what, whatever manner of publishing, you know, there needs to be some sort of a track record out there that shows one, that you're pursuing it, and two, that you're improving. That the blog post that you posted two years ago is not as good as the one you posted yesterday. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like there's got to be something there. Like, the, all these people are like, oh, I want to be a writer and I'm waiting for somebody to give me an opportunity. Fuck that. Quit waiting for an opportunity. Just go do it. Like, do, you either love doing this or you don't. I think the same thing applies to filmmaking, anything else. You got all these people that sit around waiting for their big fucking movie deal. And it's like, dude, you've got an iPhone in your pocket or whatever. Go make your fucking movie. Go make your documentary, whatever. Like, if you actually want to do this profession, start doing it. You don't need anybody's permission. I think that that's huge because even just within, like, the MFA program and kind of seeing the other side because it's like with Dead Reckoning, it was kind of fringe. And we're like, let's just make this happen to become publication and start putting works out there. And then now kind of seeing the other side of it and... I, I mentioned Dead Reckoning. I talk about Dead Reckoning with other students, and most of them are 40, 50 year old women or even men. And they're like, This is kind of what I have. And it's like short little stories here and there. And it's just like, That's all their resume is. And they don't write professionally. And I'm like, like What have you been doing for the past 20 years? And I know that they don't have maybe the, the tech savvy of what social media offers and the, the uh, accessibility to people and their attention on, on their phone or whatever. But once you kind of start getting your name and your brand out there, you're going to find those people who are interested in you and with that you find people most people that want to be writers are probably actually good writers so how do you start separating yourself with that and it's like at first with this journalist saying that you're saying like the, that they didn't have a face attached to them well to be a good writer you almost have to have your name mean something too and then that means you yourself means something eventually the byline is important right the name you're putting on the article is important because that's what people are going to look into as far as like, do I believe what this person is reporting or saying or, or anything like that? And so I think especially in journalism, it's why on Coffee or Die, we don't really allow uh, pen names outside of satire. Like I use a pen name for satire just so that my satirical work is not mixed up with my serious journalistic work, right? We make the exception for satire because it's humorous. It's, it's fine, right? Um, everything else though, the name means something. We, you know, you, if you can't, if, if you're not serious enough, serious enough about what you're saying to put your name on it, then yeah, you know what I mean? Well, like, and I'm, I'm having a problem with that personally. It's like now I've made a name somewhat for myself, but now it's like, okay, maybe it conflicts with certain things. And so now you kind of walk in this line. But as a good writer, you find a way to walk that line, yeah. you know, where you still hold truth and still the responsibilities of your family or your career or, or your reputation and everything. And so 
there, there is a way of doing it. People have done it forever. And if you wanted a pen name to begin with, just to maybe stand yourself out, when people Google you, Tyler Carroll is a pretty common name, unfortunately. And so, okay, I had my middle name, you know, and that makes it a little more exclusive in some sense. And so you can, there's ways of going about it, you know, and as a writer, your writing isn't, like, obviously that's your work, but your name and your lifestyle and, and like who you are, how you hold yourself accountable and the people you surround yourself with and, and how you talk to yourself in interviews and stuff. Like, it's not just the writing that, yeah. that, that stands alone on, its, on, yeah. on itself. Like, it should in some sense, but people are going to do their research, especially now. Yeah, and I think I think that particularly applies to like journalism, news reporting. If you're writing novels and you want to use a pen name, I think that's fine, but you shouldn't be obscuring your face either though. You can't be an anonymous author, I don't think. It's one thing if you want to say, "Hey, I want to use a pen name for X, Y, or Z reasons, but my face is still out there. I'm still putting that me out there. It's just I'm using this name." I think that's fine, but in journalism, when you're reporting news and you're reporting on things that are potentially sometimes very unflattering to people or will land people in jail, you know, like there's many journalists do very serious work. You need to, if if you're going to be putting some of the stuff out there that you do as a journalist, your name has to be attached to it. Is Coffee Die doing some of those kind of hot topic issues right now that are really calling out some people? Um, you know, I don't think we've called out anybody yet. There's or Or even some... institutions of anything. Yeah, so some of our coverage in the law enforcement space, you know, my big thing is I always try to make sure it's even in that, you know, for every story that we do that's maybe critical of an officer or uh, the institution of law enforcement that we're also, I think too many, too many reporters, too many publications only show the bad. We need it. There's not, for every one shithead, uh, you know, in a PD, there's probably 10 that are fucking rock stars that are out there making their community a better place. And we need to reflect that in our editorial strategy, right? Um, but yeah, there's certain things that we've done where it's, um, you know, we've reported on things that are not necessarily flattering to a department or whatever, or reported on things that aren't necessarily flattering to the military. You know, we've done stories on sexual harassment and sexual assault in the military and um, some of the effects of that. And yeah, you know. And in, even with some of those people that have come forward, it's like they're they're putting their name out there, you know. Like you need to. There's some responsibility with that. <clears throat> there is, and if you think it's fucking uncomfortable and and scary, it's, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not it's not awesome sometimes. And some of the feedback that you get, uh, I mean, we just put out a story the other day that over three thousand journalists were killed last year, you know, around the world. Like it's there's real world consequences. For, for reporting, you know? Um, it's always crazy, like, is, <clears throat> you've been in this world longer than I have personally, um, and I hear it around the fire station a lot. I don't know how much you heard it as, as in, in your past job as, as, as a police officer, but it seems to be the common thing to do is just push blame onto the media and journalists or one of those people that they're pointing at, you know? And, as somebody who's part of the media, even though it's social media and Instagram now, I'm like, man, so do you understand that, like, one, it's a business most of the time, and so they're trying to get as much views and much click as they can and put as much things in front of your face as they can in one aspect, but also holding to the truth as much as they can as well. And that, and that's that, those are their responsibilities, to be a business and operational and then holding the truth to the story. And it's like they're just giving you what's actually out there and also what you want because when they do these feel-good stories, it is, it was, Keith and I talk about it all the time. It's like we put something out there that we think is great and feel-good and it's like eh, just a little bit of buzz. As soon as like I, he texts me saying, hey, I'm about to put something or whatever, I'm like, sounds good, and just poof, immediate like attraction, con con like controversial, it's and it's like... I don't know how much we are like I know there we have some responsibility to it but it's like you guys are the ones who are eating this up like it's well and I think one of the big things is yeah like you said it's easy to place blame on the media or blame on journalists or something especially if they if a journalist writes something unflattering about you or your business or something like that like yeah it's easy to hate on journalists and one of the things I like to say is everybody likes to hate it's fun to hate journalists until you need one until your voice isn't heard on something until something bad happens to you and nobody believes you and you need that investigative reporter to go out there and tell your story tell your side of the story so you could like relate to that totally if 
being a police officer and like that, and that may have contributed to why you probably wanted to step away from it is nobody wanted you around, unfortunately, until. It's well, it's one of the, it's around. just like, exactly. It's just like journalists. Like it's so easy to hate on cops uh, until you need one. And that's like a universal experience going to calls. It's like uh, everyone who calls 911 needing cops is pumped that you can show up to help them because you don't show up. What are they going to do? Um, but that, you know, there are still those shitheads and it's equally as important and there's a responsibility to tell that story too. The point, I think the important piece is to tell that story the same way you would tell a positive story and not promote that one shithead story because it generates such a good response. You know, tell it evenly so that everyone knows the reality of what's going on with fire, police, any story that... Uh, I guess written about and to that point yeah just like with cops just like the military or anything else you got that segment of your overall demographic that is not the best representation right same thing with journalists right not all journalists are created equal some of them are doing super shady things and and stuff like that but I don't think that that's the majority just like it's not the majority with cops or people in the military or fucking accountants people on Wall Street whatever like there's all these institutions that people love to demonize, you know, lawyers, doctors, whatever, right? Like most people, you know, it, like with doctors, right? It's would be very easy to focus on the doctors that end up losing their license over malpractice, right? They're not the majority, you know? Um, what is real funny, and this is like calling myself out in my own community out, and I'm not going to go too, too deep into it, but let's touch on the cop things like 911 they're calling us in their in their emergency and as a firefighter that people just naturally love no matter what we do it seems like like we'd show up on scene and somebody's fighting with you guys and I just walk over I'm like hey I'm Tyler I'm fire I'm firefighter come over here and it's like immediately like demeanor change they're cool and I'm like able to get every bit of information I want out of them and I'm like man you're telling me more than you probably should and then like the cop comes over like hey here's your license I'm like thanks asshole and I'm like dude calm down he's just doing his job and they're like yeah, I know, but fuck that guy. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> and like, and okay. in that made up scenario you just talked yeah. about, like, who got there first? The I know. cop. Why I know. are you not Every excited the cop's here to help you? Like, he, almost. you know, put his life in danger to get there fast. So Almost every time. And it's like, it's funny because, like, as firefighters, like, we had, like, this, like, this, it's like, oh, they're, they're great no matter what they do. And, like, nobody's calling us out right now. And <laughs> it's like, that's Well, you guys put out the sexy calendars, calendars I know, you know? I know. And I'm like, man, this is, uh, we're like walking, walking this dangerous line because like the military is being called out, the police are being called out, like firefighters. Well, are... it used to be that way with the military, right? Like we got a little bit heavy handed with the hero worship. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's the case with firefighters where people are heavy handed with uh, the hero worship of firefighters. But that being said, firefighters, you know, are usually not responsible for taking lives. No, we're not. We're not very you controversial. Know, unlike the military or police officers or you know, things like that. It, it, it's it's like you're usually not putting, like your own, every situation you're putting into is with the express intent of saving a life. It, it will not helping. And then it, it's funny because you were talking about the, the doctors and, it, and it's crazy because people don't want to trust cops. People don't even want to trust doctors right now. And then like yeah. we come into the si situation and they like expect this decathlon brain surgeon to handle their baby being whatever. And like they will immediately hand over a child to you and I'll be like, all right, I got six months of paramedicine training. Let me take care of your baby. And they will set, believe and do everything I say with that authority. And they, on my scene presence and that command control, they're like, okay, sounds good. And a doctor will come over and I'm like, I've been a pediatrician for 20 years. And they're like, get away. I don't believe in that. And it's like, all right, whatever, come over here. And it, 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 it's just this weird responsibility that firefighters have, police have, journalists have that like they're like these, that I think people just need to really understand the responsibility of, of Understand that you represent something larger than yourself, and upholding to that truth and that and that kind of uh, uh, that representation of all of it. And when there are those bad apples, it can ruin it for all. Unfortunately, there hasn't been too many bad apples in the fire surface. Mm -hmm. Maybe like just within like brotherly rank, where you're like, ah, I don't respect you for whatever reason. But we haven't done it too much controversial. Like we've done a really good job doing that, like a vetting system in some sense. Mm -hmm. Like. It's just any kind of conflict's kind of internal. There's also like less of a window for a firefighter to abuse power. You know, mm -hmm. you give a firefighter power to go into a building or not go into a building or do what they need to do medically or not do. And, you know, normally they make the right decision, but there isn't that power to take a life, take freedom, 
take custody of something. Uh, so when you heap that extra power onto a police officer, there's more opportunities for someone to abuse it or make the wrong decision. Yeah. And I guess that's just the same responsibility of upholding to a story and the truth. And, right. And then and now even as this responsibility of picking people who, like, you're bringing onto the team because, again, you're representing something larger than yourself. And so bringing Mac on after his career within that, like, now you're saying, hey, you have become some kind of subject matter expert with this responsibility and this kind of authority of uh, recommending stuff because you actually obviously have a good eye for this. Uh, can you talk about what th his role is going to be within the, the company now? Yeah, so uh, Mac's going to do everything that I don't want to do. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, so we've, you know, cough your die. We're only about three years old right now, uh, but we've undergone a pretty aggressive expansion as a publication in large thanks to, you know, Black Rifle Coffee has continued to aggressively expand, right? And... Um, I think that, as, you know, as we've had opportunities to build our team and expand our fo footprint as a publication, it's, it's been very important to bring on the right people at the right time and prioritize, you know, just because you're a good writer doesn't mean you're a good writer for w one vertical over another that we have, right? Like, so we cover the military, intelligence, veterans, first responder communities, and we've also got history vertical, an entertainment vertical, a humor vertical, right? Um, Mac may not be the right guy to run like the humor vertical, right? Like, or, or write for that necessarily. Um, but what we saw with Pipes and Pages is like, hey, he's into books. The articles he's written for us so far is okay. Mac might be right for this entertainment vertical. Maybe he's not right for vets or Mill and Intel or whatever, just because that requires a little bit more hard news reporting experience. And Mac doesn't have that right now. Um, but what he can do is start to kind of sharpen his, his knife a little bit in the entertainment vertical, get used to that writing cadence of, uh, you know, putting out stories on the, on a regular basis. Um, he can start to hone his interviewing skills and, and the reporting skills that maybe he'll be able to use in other verticals later on. Right. But you know, for him starting off and as a new staff writer for us, he's going to be working with senior editors that are extremely competent. So, um, Mac will be reporting into Ethan Rocky. Ethan Rocky uh, is both an Army and Marine Corps veteran. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's got bylines in a lot of major publications. He's, his work with us so far has been exceptional. And uh, Mac is going to have the opportunity to come in as a relatively new writer, as a, and, and as, but come on to a staff writer position and learn from uh, a really great editor that's going to help shape him as a writer, hone his skills, and and uh, you know, get them going in the right direction. Provide valuable feedback. I mean, I think you were talking earlier about a, a phone call that you did. Yeah. So we've had a very brief. You know, this is a new relationship, but from the few articles me and Ethan have gone back and forth with, he's provided so much help that uh, immediately it was clear. Okay, this is a rare opportunity to get to work under someone like him, and he's had that perfect balance of like not worrying about whether or not I have thick skin. He'll tell me when something's bad, when I need to change something, but he doesn't just say, it's bad, try again. He says, here's what needs work. Here's what I would recommend. Try this, this, and this. Let's see what happens next. So uh, it's already been invaluable and we've yeah. just started. And that's like, hey, you're a staff writer now. You're doing this, prof you're officially on April 1st, a professional writer, right? Like. And that's the transition you make of, it's no more about like, I'm not an auteur. I'm not trying to perfect the perfect American novel or something like that. Or it's, hey, I'm coming into work every day and, and putting articles out. You know, I'm putting stories out and they need to be good. And I can't be precious about my work. I can't be, you know, I have to work with the editor. I'm going to be pitching stories. I'm going to be receiving assignments. I'm, you know, going to be doing a lot of stuff that is just actual work. It's not the fairy tale princess idea of a writer and uh, you know sitting at my little quaint cottage and typing out beautiful prose it's like no i'm sitting behind a fucking computer trying to get people on the phone trying to come up with ideas uh f you know like stressed out like it, it's you know how what am i gonna do today i don't got shit to write about like it's you know you're, you're coming into life as a professional writer um and a lot i think it's you know there's a lot of people 
that want to be writers, that want to be professional writers, but when it comes time to do professional writer stuff, shit gets a little scary. Shit gets a little hairy. Do you think that that, it conflicts at all with that aspirations of putting out the best-selling novel and all of that because this is quick, instinctual writing with a filter through your editor and everything. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's almost, you do have to trust your instincts. And like you said, you, ha you know your voice, you know that confidence. And it probably builds that confidence because you're getting that uh, affirmation from your editor and just positive feedback, like I said, just based off these few conversations. But do you think it conflicts at all with actually trying to write the long narratives, novels and all Oh, I love how you think he's going to get positive feedback. <laughs> or negative. You know, I, I prefer, <laughs> so that's also, we can get down this, is like, I learned the best after being shamed, you know, because I'm like, oh, yeah. Hey, this shit sucks, or you shouldn't have done this. And I'm like, or I wake up the next morning after a bad night of drinking, and I'm like, fuck, man, like, I made a fool of myself. You know? Legitimately, <laughs> um, kind of the culture that we've built at Coffee or Die, and, and it is largely the culture at Black Rifle Coffee in general, which is, hey, um, if something's fucked up, you say it's fucked up. You know, we don't need to sugarcoat stuff. We don't need to, and, you know, give praise when it's deserved, give shame when it's, you know, not shame literally, but like, you know, I like to shit talk, but. Uh, legitimately it's it's like hey we're all working towards the goal here of putting out the best possible story and if it's not there it's not there and we can't tiptoe around that you know um, and that goes for everybody from me down to the newest staff writer to, to the freelancers it's hey if it's not there it's not there but that being said when you are um, you know writing on a daily cadence and having to continually put stuff out, you don't have enough time to get inside your own head like you do with like a novel or one of these bigger works or whatever. You just, I'm coming, I have a job to do. I, I need to put something out today if I want to keep my job and put food on the table for my family. You know, it's not about being an auteur or, or being, a, you know, you know, your brand or, or anything like that. It's about like, I need to come in and do my job today. And uh, you just don't have time, I don't think, to think too much about um, whether it's good or not, or whether it's what you wanted or not, or whatever. It's just, you know, hey, I'm going to be, I'm putting in the reps. This stuff's going to get better over time. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But hopefully what I put out to tomorrow is a little bit better than what I put out today. You know? Um, and I think that's where, for a guy like Mac, like, you know, uh, when you get to write your first book at some point, uh, you, you know, you're having that experience as a staff writer first, is going to be hugely influential in the success of that first book that you do, whatever that may be, you know? Yeah, I think um, I can already tell with Ethan, like another great thing about him is he hasn't said, you know, I don't write something in my voice. And he goes, no, if you wrote it like me, it would be better. You know, he already recognizes we write different things and he just helps me make the best thing that I would make. He doesn't try and uh, change what I'm trying to do with it. Um, but yeah, as far as writing a book, like we've talked about writing books before, and even though I have the volume down, I know it's not where it needs to be. So this is just another amazing opportunity to get better so I can make that first book better, where if I rush it and put it out, it's not going to be what I want it to be. Yeah, it's all about getting the reps, like you, you talk about all the time. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and again, too, it's not everybody's going to have the opportunity to be a staff writer right off the bat or anything like that. But it is, hey... the. You don't need to wait for somebody to give you an opportunity. You know, you, you need to just start doing stuff. Um, you need to start writing, start making that tracker, and hopefully at some point you do. And not everybody aspires to be like a staff writer or anything like that. It is one path to take, right? It's not the be-all, end-all. It's the path that Mac is taking. Um, but you do notice, like, hey, a lot of the people that are getting – big book contracts and stuff, they're journalists. They're people that are writing professionally. They're a safer bet for a book editor, you know, to yeah, take you like, on. Like you said, you walk up to do a job, or you wake up to do a job every day, walking up to the computer, making those phone calls, thinking about what's going on in society and how you fit into that within your writing skills and your specialty within entertainment. It's like, okay, what's going on in the world that I can contribute to, and I need to get it done quickly yeah. in the most attractive fashion possible. And that's even when I was just you know, freelancing where there's no deadline, I came up with most of the topics and when it was done, it was done. Uh, I treated it like work, you know, I, I was, had left the police department trying to move on to something like a staff position. So I, you know, would go to the office, shut the door. I'm at work, even though I'm at home, like I'm at work 
And that's if I was just trying to write the perfect piece of something I was really interested in, and when it was perfect, it was perfect. Uh, I I don't think I would have been able to put out the things I put out. I, you know, like you were saying, you just have to treat it like a job, even though when uh, it's not, you know, glamorized and it sucks. It's you just have to wake up early because you're going to work. Do you think that the personality that the military attracts with like? The team environment, and then also just that the added pressure of what combat entails, and that the profession itself entails. This is like that type of personality, uh, also like, attracted to the staff writer position because it is like you're kind of being put in the ringer. You are going out into the field doing all this stuff. Like what you just did the past week, you know, like your your time away from your family. You're staying up late. You're putting in the hours, no matter what. Uh, but with that kind of lingering pressure in some sense, or responsibility, or sense of obligation, whatever you want to call it, you thrive under it because you, you know there's a deadline. There, there, there's consequences if I don't get this done, whether they're made up or on your own, self-imposed, all that good stuff. Uh, that pressure, I think we all kind of operate better under it. I know I at least like to think I do. Yeah, I think... Um... I think that your experience in the military, depending on what you did, potentially helps you with that to a certain degree. But I think the persona of a writer and the things that come along with that as far as like insecurities and ego and all the different traits of a writer, a professional writer, I think those a lot of times override the traits or or are more influential than your experience in the military. Certainly for me, um, you know, the wanting to get out in the field and push myself and report even if it's raining or snowing or whatever, you know, I, yeah, that like, you know, that gets me up in the morning for sure. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it, I think doing this as a job and writing in day in and day out, it's, you know, it, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot to take on. And I think whether you were in the military or not, it's a difficult thing to do. And, I think there's a lot of people, they want to be writers and, and stuff like that. But like, you know, again, that pressure of like pumping something out every day or whatever, it's, it, it's a lot, you know, that's, I don't think the military necessarily prepares you for that. Um, it doesn't prepare you for like the insecurities that you have. There's no structure like the military in, in, in the military, there are very well-defined pathways to success, right? I need this many promotion points. I need this course. I need to go to this school. I need to pass this. Whereas with this, it's kind of like, you know, when you're writing, there's no, like, yeah, there's defined metrics of, uh, yeah, you need to put out this many articles or you need this many words for this specific article or whatever. So you can meet that bare minimum of like, here's the parameters of what you're doing. But if it fucking sucks, you're not going to keep working, you know? And so, and you know that, you know, um, you know, I think at Coffee or Die, we're pretty good. We do a pretty good job of one. I think we're getting the right people from the get go. But on top of that, uh, as long as people are showing improvement and that they're devoted to the craft and they're trying to get better every day and are showing that, Hey, they're taking notes and we keep working with them, you know? Um, but if you're like that person, it's like, not showing up to work. Sorry, I'm burping a little bit. Um, old burpees, you know, just whoops a daisy right up the <laughs> esophagus. Um, you know, uh, if you're not doing that stuff, you know, if you're not showing up to meetings or you know, just doing the stuff that you should have learned in the military, right? Like show up to fucking formation on time, then that gets difficult. You know, then it's like okay. Okay, you're not very good at writing. You're not compel- writing compelling stories or getting good scoops or anything like that. And also, you're not showing up or you're, you know, being fucking lazy and stuff. And it's like, well, what incentive do I have to keep you around, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it all just, it kind of depends. But yeah, I don't think, I think that the military lifestyle can prepare you for certain aspects of the job, especially what we do at Coffee Dive, where we put a very large emphasis on getting out in the field, reporting on the ground, putting yourself out there. Um, I think that stuff definitely helps. But at the end of the day, it's still a very different profession. You know, writing, reporting, all of that. It's just a different profession. And you ultimately, I think a lot of guys I tell them, like you got to pour yourself into learning this trade and and improving at it the same way you poured yourself into becoming a good soldier, airman, marine, whatever. You know, uh, 
you know, how, how many hours did it take you to become a team leader, right? There's, I think there's a lot of people that come into writing who think like, oh, I'm just right off the bat going to fucking, you know, be like an editor or, or, you know, get the staff writer job or anything like that. Like, think about how many hours you've put into other things that you've done professionally before you got to any level of responsibility. That applies to writing, you know? Um, and so it's like, yeah, there's a certain amount of you have to put in the time and certainly some people move faster than others. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of putting in the work. And if you are able to carry over a work ethic from the military, uh, that can be advantageous, but there's just a lot of different, th there's a lot of different elements to this. What you take away from the military is just part of that. Do you think that that's going to translate for you? Well, and like, what was like, what are you yeah, most nervous I, and excited about? Well, I, from the work I've already done, uh, writing is a totally different beast than, you know, being in the military, but the added pressure of a boss giving you a deadline and having a certain expectation of the quality of work helps me. So I know when I'm writing for me, a book, poetry, whatever, uh, I give myself way more leeway because no one else is riding on it, but the rest of the staff is paying you and counting on you to perform. And that helps motivate me to stick to a deadline, wake up early, edit appropriately, uh, receive criticism uh, appropriately, where if I handed someone a passion project and they trashed it, it would feel different than if someone says, no, this needs work, here's why. Yeah, cause, cause I think like there's a little bit too of like, especially when you're joining a team of writers, a little bit of competitiveness. I think that certainly plays, plays into it where, you know, you're going to be one of, you know, f five or six staff writers, I think, plus the freelance pool where, you know, you're looking at, oh, well, fucking, you know, Josh is putting out 10 articles a week and, you know, he's, his are getting a ton of. Uh, reads on them and stuff like that or or hey you know the person you know this person's doing that or 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 hey I, that person's a senior editor i think that i'm as good as them if not better and i need to fucking prove it you know there's i think there's a certain competitiveness that friendly competitiveness we're all a team but you should be looking at the guy to your left and right and saying like i'm you know guy or gal um and saying hey i'm better than you and i'm gonna go prove it you know, not in an unfriendly way, but like you're, you know, you're trying to prove that like, hey, everybody's fighting for their spot every day. I'm a big believer. Everybody should be coming into work every day trying to prove that they deserve that job, that they, that they deserve to be at work that day. That applies to me. I, I often self, in a self-deprecating way, joke about, you know, people are like, oh, hey, coffee dye is doing great. And, you know, blah, blah, you know, and it's like, and my response is always like, again, very self-deprecating, but it's like, yep, just trying to not get fired, you know, <laughs> maybe that's a little bit, you know, yeah, I don't think I'm on the verge of getting fired on any given day per se, but it's like, I kind of talk myself into it because you almost need to have that mindset of, hey, nothing's fucking guaranteed, yeah. you know, it's not, that's the difference between this and the military and the military, you got to fuck up pretty bad. You got to like murder somebody to get, you know, like, yeah. Like, you know, the job is pretty much guaranteed every day, right? Um, with this, it's that there's the, those guarantees aren't there, you know. And you were saying how many writers are desperate to land a job like that. So, as soon as someone who's a staff writer or is, gets too comfortable, there's a thousand people who are working their ass off to take that spot. So, once you land that spot, yep. you got uh, I mean, and even at every level, right? Like, I think. You know, I joke about, you know, we've got a great team of senior editors at Coffee or Die right now. We've got, you know, a Pulitzer nominee. We've got a New York Times bestselling author. We've got a guy who's done conflict reporting on like fucking four different continents. You know, we've got uh, another guy who's got major bylines and was the editor in chief of a print magazine down in North Carolina. Like we've got some heavy hitter senior editors. Every one of them could do my, is more qualified for my job as the, uh, executive editor it's and I use that from like hey I need to show up every day and earn these guys respect because I'm not the first editor they've worked with I'm not the first writer they've worked with I need to earn their respect every day and prove that I deserve my job at the as the top guy at this publication yeah. you know uh, that's you and, and that that should be filtering down everywhere because those senior editors should be proving every day hey I deserve to be here as a senior editor I, I'm outworking my staff writers I'm improving the people under me and being a value add all the way around and those staff writers should be fucking hungry you know getting after it 
and that that applies to the copy editors, that applies to the social media. Everybody that's involved in this should be hungry. And ultimately, too, we're, we're, we're working for a publication that hasn't been around for 100 years, right? We're three years old. We're still proving ourselves as a publication. Nobody should be fucking comfortable. You know what I mean? Like, we should all be getting after it. And I think um, that's one of the things that we want, uh, you know, with people coming onto the team is people that are hungry and scrappy and ready to fucking do work, you know? Well, I just assume that, you know, with Mac, again, you, you saw that self-motivation, um, that initiative, and like, hey, he went and created pipes and pages without anybody telling him to do that. You know what and I mean? That, to me, that just really just shows that, that creativity that a writer needs to have, because that's how you create stories. You know, you see a need for something and an interest that you personally have that you know other people are going to have. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that that's what kind of boiled down to, at least for pipes and pages. Yeah. Know? And... Uh, writing from day one from pipes and pages too whether it was for myself or asking you guys hey can i write book reviews for you like yeah. no money exchange no just like you did write i think you have the right like we've got a similar audience i want to write more you're like great let's do it so like scratching my teeth well, on so that i really think we probably one of the first people that published probably anything that you yeah that it wasn't yeah. just like putting on something i made something yeah. someone else wanted my writing it was with you guys yeah it was a matter of i'm pretty sure too I it mean, was yeah keep goes, talking about. yeah keep circling back to old parlantes but yeah, yeah. F first one was uh was matterhorn yeah it, it, the, the idea with of, of this particular conversation was to show like what coffee diet doing and like how how great it is to see an aspiring writer be able to be trusted into that role and to show how much responsibility and self-initiative it was on you to do it because again nobody's just going to hand you the op people are going to hand you the opportunity once you've already kind of proved yourself you know you can't just like like hey i'm mac i like to write can i write for you and it's like the key is kind of proved yourself yeah so come april 1st is <laughs> when i actually have to prove myself yeah uh it, it, it i think it's just incredibly important for people to really understand that like you can do whatever you want right now and it's going to attract some kind of attention. Hopefully, it becomes positive. Hopefully, it becomes inspirational. Hopefully, it becomes attractive. And, and, and then people will notice it and say, okay, yeah, this is what needs to come on board with us or somebody else. And it, it is totally up to the individual to make that happen. And then once you start and surround yourself with the right community, obviously, then you can kind of get these great opportunities. I think it applies to everything, not just writing, but you have to be working your ass off every day even when you don't see that opportunity yet, you can't wait for it and then start working hard. You gotta be working and working so when that tiny opportunity opens up, you can dive in and you're prepared for it. And then once you're in that position, you work twice as hard. So when the next opportunity opens up, you can dive in. And it's, that- it, We were talking about before about you not wanting to necessarily be this entre entrepreneur at one point and you wanted to be more of a writer. But when you are a writer, you are selling yourself in some sense and yeah. you yourself are the business. Yeah. And I do think I do credit, you know, like, you know, standing up coffee or die, like that's kind of entrepreneurial in its essence of your standing up publication, even though it was in, within this larger infrastructure of like Black Rifle Coffee, right? Like, um, but you still have to have that kind of like same self starter mentality. Uh, and yeah, that applies at, for any writer who it's like yeah you are creating it there's a lot of writers that have their own llc just for their books and things like that like for a lot of writers it is if you're a freelance writer yeah that's that's a business you know you are you know you need to have some of those entrepreneurial entrepreneurial uh traits for sure yeah i think that's what i really wanted to kind of boil down out of this conversation is that it is really up to the individual to see their worth and, and put themselves out there continually with that work ethic that passion that creativity in order to get that story told man even if you don't see your own worth like you can sit there and fucking hate yourself but still still go out there you know a lot of writers say hey i fucking hate looking at myself in the mirror but i'm still gonna get up and put fucking words down on paper you know like you can't use the excuse at all oh, i fucking hate myself well you me and fucking everybody else right like fucking do work shut up you know well we'll end it there man i appreciate y'all coming on and uh Thanks to Coffee or Die and Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring this trip as the writing workshop in this podcast specifically. Yeah, drink, uh, drink America's coffee. There you go. <laughs> thanks, Tyler. Yeah, thanks, Tyler.